Um, I want a little go back on a previous show as well when I talked about the Electoral College and Republican re um, Republican form of government that I actually posted on Facebook an article regarding the Electoral College and Republican form of government and how we need to safeguard that. So I, I hopefully if you're on Facebook, go to the Mobius Strip press page and pull up my article on this because what the progressives are trying to do is they're trying to get you to believe that a popular vote is so that everybody's voice counts. Well, that's good if we actually had an honest democracy, but there are evils to democracy that the wise men that founded this country kept us away from. We have a democratic representation and a democratic representative process but we are not to be a democracy of mob rules because when we do that, we literally have a minor majority actually oppressing a major minority um, and we don't want to go down that road. So it's very critical that we actually save our electoral college. Now today, I'm actually uh, grinning ear to ear and you can probably see that on your speakers of the radio there or your headphones. Um, and I'm grinning because we're going to actually sink our teeth into one of the most eye-opening and educational documents ever provided by President James Madison. I've referenced this before, and I've talked about uh, and asked everybody to read Madison's veto of what I call the bonus bill. Um, and I know some of you have jumped ahead and have actually read this, and I've uh, had a few conversations um, either offline or in private with some people that have read this, and they go, well, this is an eye-popping document. So for those who have not yet read this, and I just need to um, be um, thorough in this documentation coverage, of this program because we're trying to reclaim the Republic. It's important that we have all the empirical facts and all the data in front of us. So I know reading this stuff is hard and it actually ties my tongue up in knots. Uh, and it's just like reading the Bible. It too is difficult, but that's no reason not to read it and to get enlightened. And so we have to read these founding documents. So I, um, don't want to paraphrase anything. I want to actually quote and cite what, uh, what Madison has said. Our republic's history is equally important as our Bible because it is the freedom and the freedom of religious expression and conscience that allows us to have our religious freedom in reading the Bible. The day we lose our constitution and our inalienable rights to a tyrannical and despotic government is the day that Christianity will be on the, uh, on the run and it will be persecuted just like it was in Christ's day. So if we fail to understand our history, then someone will come along and pull the shenanigans like they've been doing for the past half century and we will end up losing our individual liberties and sovereignty and our constitution and our republic may quickly go out the window and we'll find ourselves unable to worship according to our conscience and according to the good word. So let's get informed and let's get involved in saving the republic before it's too late. Remember that our Lord will allow our enemies to prosper to humble us. But I digress. Let me get into this bonus bill. So let me set the background on this. The bonus bill um, is a, the, the final bill that was brought before President Madison. And it was basically at his behest, or actually his friends from Congress came over and said, we want to create this bill for you. And we want to do this, um, this great legislature that will be a hallmark for your presidency. And a little more back note on this, because I don't think I've ever mentioned this, that this was post-1812 war and the, fine, the end of the real Revolutionary War that had been going from 1775 to 1817. And so the government was just finally, you know, closing down, you know, this, this large Revolutionary War that we'd been fighting and the insurrections and so forth. And so anyway, as... Um, as Congress came to him and said, we want to create this Hallmark bill for you, um, uh, Madison basically kind of went into this, this 
rant or he went into the starry eyed mode of, oh, if the republic could only have the power or if the, if the general government could only have the power to manage the highways and waterways, then, you know, we could really take this country into an economic power that the whole world wouldn't be able to compete with. And so um, they go off, they send them this bill that is basically, um, I call it the bonus bill, but I think it's the infrastructure bill. Um, and in, I'll read the actual title to it because Madison reads it out in his veto. Um, but he vetoes this bill, even though he kind of told them this is what they need to do. And he really agrees this is what they need to do. But he points out that the only way the federal government can have a Department of Transportation is by amending the Constitution. So this is going to span over the break. So uh, let me try to be uh, very quick in reading this, but I want to read this in its entirety. So this is Madison speaking. Having considered the bill this day presented to me entitled an act to set apart and pledge certain funds for internal improvements and which sets apart and pledges funds for constructing roads and canals and improving the navigation of watercourses in order to facilitate, promote, and give security to internal commerce among the several states and to render more easy and less expensive the means of provisions for the common defense, I am constrained by the insuperable or overwhelming difficulty I feel in reconciling the bill with the Constitution of the United States to return it with that objection to the House of Representatives in which it originated. So I'm going to insert, you know, some little editorializing as we go here. But Madison clearly just basically said, here you've created this bill for um, the Department of Transportation. And he has this overwhelming responsibility and concern that and he can't sign it because it's not something that they can do within the Constitution. But the beautiful thing is he just doesn't leave it with that. He actually goes on further and he says, the legislative powers vested in Congress are specified and enumerated in the eighth section of the first article of the Constitution. Now, you've been hearing me say this, this whole program, since I, very, since I began on Constitution Day on September 17th, I've been asserting that it is a very specified and enumerated contract. And I repeat, or I go back into what M. Addison's saying, and he says, and it does not appear that the power proposed to be exercised by the bill is among the enumerated powers, or that it fails by any just interpretation that the power to make laws necessary and proper, so he's using the necessary and proper clause here, for carrying into execution those other powers vested in the Constitution of the government of the United States. So what he just said is that it does not appear that this bill pertains to any of the powers that are enumerated. Therefore, you can't use the necessary and proper clause in carrying out um, a new power because it's not within the Constitution to be able to do that. He says the power to regulate commerce, so he's talking about the Commerce Clause now, among the several states cannot include a power to construct roads and canals and improve the navigation of watercourses. That's a mouthful. The power to regulate commerce among the several states cannot include a power to construct roads and canals and to improve the navigation of watercourses. The Supreme Court has been using this commerce clause in getting people to be taxed on what they grow in their yards. And he's saying, and they've been using this commerce clause and necessary property and all these other clauses to, to create all these usurpations of power, such as the Department of Transportation and so forth. I, I don't mean to go into this long rant of editorializing, but clearly he's saying that they cannot use the commerce clause or the regulate commerce among the several states, that clause itself because he's quoting it, they can't use that to create this new power. And he goes on and says, in order to facilitate, promote, and secure such commerce without a latitude of construction or a latitude of modifying or changing interpretation, in other words, because it's not black and white in the Constitution, that contract, 
you you you'd have to be you know imagining that it's there so he goes on and says departing from the original uh, uh, the ordinary import of the term strengthened by the known inconveniences with doubtless led to the grant of this remedial power to congress so in other words what had happened is the Congress kind of presumed some of these remedial powers of being able to improve highways and waterways during the Revolutionary War. And he says, departing up, oh, departing from the ordinary part. I hear the music. It's so uh, coming up on the break, but departing from the ordinary import of the term strengthened by the known inconveniences, which led to the doubtless or which doubtless led to the grant of the remedial power to Congress. So he's just saying that Congress had this power, but they don't permanently get to keep this power because of war. We'll be right back after this break. Thank you and stay tuned. Okay, so what I ended up with was a little um, back reference that Madison was making that just because we've been granted or been assuming these powers outside of the Constitution was for uh, for a remedial purpose or for the purpose of war doesn't mean that we can maintain these types of powers. There have been times where the federal government or the general government because of war and national emergency um, has you know basically assumed and um, FDR assumed all sorts of latitude without the states, you know, getting involved in um, in amending the Constitution to allow him to take and seize control of the industry, population production and everything else. So anyway, Madison is basically saying, hey, the war is over. You can't make this jump from this remedial power to making this a permanent power. So he's just kind of putting a curtailed end to that reference. And so moving up towards Uh, The next section here, this is Madison again saying, to refer the power in question to the clause to provide for common defense and general welfare would be contrary to the established and consistent rules of interpretation as rendering the special and careful enumeration of powers which follow that clause nugatory and improper. In other words, in the very beginning of um, Article uh, 1, Section 8, it has this little preamble that's, that basically allows for common defense and welfare, but it doesn't create this ambiguity because what follows that, as he's saying, is this consistent rule of interpretation of the enumeration of powers. And that's why he says that there. He says as rendering the special and careful enumeration of powers which follow this clause of the common defense and general welfare, that clause would be nugatory and improper um, because those enumerated powers. In other words, you can't have ambiguity and then this list. It was more of a preamble to this listing of powers than it was this ambiguous ambiguous power that was granted and delegated that the federal government had unlimited powers. No, this is the very limitation to what you have, and they enumerated those within Section 8 of Article 1 of the Constitution. Anyway, let me move forward. Such a view of the Constitution would have the effect of giving to Congress a general power of legislation instead of the defined and limited one hitherto understood to belong to them. So what I just was editorializing, he kind of created his own little editorial note that the Constitution would have effect giving Congress the general power instead of defining one and limiting one. And it was very specific that it was limited Anyway, Madison goes on and says the terms common defense and general welfare embracing every object and act within the purview of a legislative trust, it would have the effect of subjecting both the Constitution and laws of the several states in all cases not specifically exempted to be superseded by laws of Congress, it being expressly declared that the So he's saying that if they had that ability to just using that, then they could do everything. Just like he said in the cod fishery bill, which I read before, 
that if the Constitution granted these ambiguous powers, then Congress would be able to appoint teachers and pay teachers out of the public trust and so forth as he rambled on and on. Um, he was making a very salient point that because we have an enumerated constitution, the powers that were delegated to the federal government are enumerated and listed either in the constitution or within amendments. And the federal government cannot exercise, even if we want them to, they cannot exercise any power that is not listed or amended to the constitution. So let me get back to Madison. So Madison goes on and says that the Constitution of the United States and the laws, whoops, I just lost my head because these, these words are just eye-opening. My eyes are just popping out here. Uh, anyway, I'm sorry about that interruption. That the Constitution of the United States and the laws made in pursuance thereof shall be the supreme law of the land, and the judges of every state shall be bound thereby anything in the Constitution or laws of any state, to the contrary notwithstanding. Such a view of the Constitution finally would have the effect of excluding the judicial authority of the United States from its participation in guarding the boundary be, uh, between the legislative powers of the general government and the states, inasmuch as questions relating to the general welfare being questions of policy and expediency are unsusceptible of judicial cognizance and decision. So he's, he's saying that if Congress was the king, then they wouldn't need a judiciary, they wouldn't need the states, Congress would just have all of these powers, and that is not the government they created. They created a, a government of separation of powers between the states and the federal government, and within the federal government, a balance of powers between the executive, the legislative, and the judiciary. So um, this thing that they were trying to do in creating this Department of Transportation would just throw all of that away and say, now Congress can just do whatever they want to do. He goes on and says, a restriction of the power to provide for the common defense and general welfare to cases which are to be provided for by the expenditure of money would still leave within the legislative power of Congress all the great and most important measures of government, money being the ordinary and necessary means to carrying them into execution. If a general power to construct roads and canals and to improve the navigation of water courses with the train of powers incident thereto not to be possessed by Congress, the assent or the agreement of the states in the mode provided in the bill cannot confer the power. In other words, even if they wanted to do all of this and the state said, yeah, we're going to let you do this. And by the way, folks, this is what's been going on. The states haven't step up, stepped up and said, hey, you got to change the Constitution. They just started going down this path of doing something. And the states kind of stepped aside and said, I guess you can do that because you tell us you can. Here he clearly says that even if the assent of the states in the mode provided through this bill or through some Regula uh, regulation statute or some other bill like what they want to do with the Electoral College, they, they still do not have the authorized power conferred upon them. The only case, and he says this right here, this is his words, the only cases in which the consent and concession of particular states can extend the power of Congress are those specified and provided for in the Constitution. In other words, the only case, the only way that they can actually take on and assume a new role, responsibility, or power is through the Article V process of an amendment. And so Madison says this in going on. He says, I am not unaware of the great importance of the roads and canals um, and the improved navigation of water courses and that a power in the national legislature to provide for them might be exercised by signal advantage to the general prosperity. But seeing that such a power is not expressly given by the Constitution and believing it can, cannot be deduced from any part of it without an inadmissible latitude. So in other words, he says, you, 
the only way you could come to a conclusion would be an inadmissible way of doing that. In other words, it's just a wrong interpretation, and you're just um, you're you're palpably or blatantly violating the Constitution by doing this. And so uh, he goes on and says, it, it without an inadmissible latitude of construction and reliance on insufficient precedents. The precedent is that you have to go through the Article 5 process where two-thirds of Congress has to vote for and pass this amendment. This president has to sign it, and then it has to go to the states, and three-fourths of the states have to ratify that amendment in delegating that power. Anyway, Madison goes on, and he closes it out with, believing also that the permanent success of the Constitution depends on a definite partition of powers between the general and the state governments. See, he's saying that there's this huge separation. The states have this power over us and that no adequate landmarks would be left by the constructive extension of the powers of Congress as proposed in this bill. In other words, they'd be wiping this out. Even though the states still have the power, they're just overreaching here. And I, and he says, I have no option but to withhold my signature from it and to cherishing the hope that its beneficial objects may be attained by a resort of the necessary power to the same wisdom and virtue in the nation which established this Constitution. He's basically saying that he's not going to sign this bill and that the only way is that they need to, and he wants to, he's saying here he wants to do this, but the only way he can sign this bill is if it's going out as an amendment to the states in asking the states to delegate this power to pay for the management of highways and roads. And he finalize, he finalizes it by saying, in its actual form and providently marked out in the instrument itself, a safe and practical mode of improving it, as experience might suggest. In other words, experience has suggested that following the Article 5 process is the only way because it's the safe way because it actually allows the states the oversight and the final say because they are the sovereigns over the federal government. Now, you may ask, well, why did I read this first? Why did I just do this at the very beginning of the show and this whole content? Because if you garner what I just read, this is very powerful, folks. It's 